In this video, I cover a wide variety of solutions you can use to fix an overtaxed Wi-Fi network, ranging from small tweaks on your wireless router all the way to adding and replacing Wi-Fi components. This is the video complement to Chapter 4 of my ebook, The Home IT Handbook, that you can download for free at wifiguy.net, the site that helps you go from computer novice to home IT pro. In this video, we'll be discussing various things you can do to improve your home network and Wi-Fi performance. The first thing you want to do is make sure your wireless router is in a central location in your home, or at least in a central location relative to all your devices. Simply moving your wireless router to an area that is accessible to all your devices can make all the difference in the world. When you're relocating your wireless router, make sure to avoid things that can stop a Wi-Fi signal dead in its tracks, like large pieces of metal and concrete. Electronic devices such as microwaves, refrigerators, and cordless phones can also interfere with a wireless signal. Your wireless router will be at its happiest on top of a bookshelf all by itself. For some reason, internet service providers have an affinity for placing their equipment in a far off corner of the house, the basement, the laundry room, or the garage. So you want to keep an eye on them and actually be present when they show up to install the equipment. If that's not possible, you may have to move it yourself. Depending on how your apartment or home is set up, this could be as simple as moving your modem, the coax cable, and your wireless router to another room with a coax connection. If there is no coax fiber or phone connection in the area of the house where you want to move things, you may have to get your internet service provider's help. Sharing flour, sugar, or bread with your neighbors is one thing. But you don't want to find yourself sharing your internet connection. Not only is it not right to have to be paying for someone else's Wi-Fi, but depending on what they're doing, they can seriously drag your internet connection down. And if they're hackers, you got a whole nother set of problems on your hand. The simple way to defeat this is by using a complex password. That means not using your home number, your name, or your street address. You want to use a string of random letters and numbers that make no sense. Yes, it is difficult to remember, but in these days they have password manager programs that make it easier to remember complex passwords. And the good thing is, most wireless devices will remember your password for you once you type it in once. Just about all wireless routers these days have two bands. A 2.4 GHz band and a 5 GHz band. The reasons for this are actually quite ingenious. For one thing, since they're on totally different frequencies, devices on one band won't interfere with devices on the other band, which allows you to have many more devices in a particular area without having to worry about them interfering with each other. They also specialize in different types of connections. The 5 GHz band is faster than the 2.4 GHz band, but it doesn't travel through obstacles as easily, while the 2.4 GHz band is slower, but it has longer range. By simply moving a device from the 2.4 GHz band to the 5 GHz band, you'll get much better performance on a device that needs a lot of bandwidth. I get into much greater detail on how to use bands with different devices and how to use a feature called Smart Connect to manage this automatically in my intro to Wi-Fi video. As I said earlier, a Wi-Fi connection is shared with all the other people and all the other devices in your home network. The way things are shared out is not always fair because some devices, such as computers and laptops, which spend a great deal of their time either surfing or checking email, don't really use a lot of bandwidth. But other devices, such as phones, which constantly stream videos, game consoles and 4K TVs use an extreme amount of bandwidth which can slow down the network for other devices. Or the shoe may be on the other foot if you're someone who's trying to watch a video 
or play a video game and someone else's activities on the network slow you down. Sometimes it may be a simple matter of finding those devices and turning them off. But if that's not possible, there are other ways to get the situation under control. The best way is something called Quality of Service, or QoS, which allows you to prioritize the devices in your home to make everything more equitable. Some types of wireless routers handle this prioritization for you, and others allow you to configure it. It doesn't happen automatically, though. At the very least, it has to be turned on. I get into great detail on how to configure QoS in my wireless router setup video. Maybe you remember back in the old days of battery-operated AM FM radios searching through the dial to find a strong station and along the way you come across many weaker stations that were overlapping each other. Many people who own wireless routers are not even aware that their wireless router has channels but they do. Your wireless router also uses radio waves and you can use channels to find a stronger connection to your wireless router if you live in an apartment or are surrounded by neighbors who also have wireless routers. It's a simple matter of finding a channel that everyone else isn't using. This is especially true on the 2.4 GHz frequency band that only has 11 channels. Out of those 11 channels, only 3 don't overlap. 1, 6, and 11. So you want to focus your attention on those three channels. The 5 GHz band has way more channels and channels that don't overlap. So it's not so much of a problem on the 5 GHz band. Most wireless router manufacturers set their routers to default to channel 6 on the 2.4 GHz band. Which means you could be living in an apartment building full of other wireless routers running on channel 6. This can make it difficult for you to get a strong connection to your wireless router. There's also a setting called Auto, which you should avoid because it can result in you ending up on a different channel every time you reboot your router. If other routers in your area are also set to Auto, you can end up with some pretty unpredictable results. So how do you know which channel to use? Well, that depends on the channels everyone else is using. You can find that out by installing a free program like a Wi-Fi Analyzer on your computer or a smartphone. It will present the information you're looking for in a simple chart format. So in this example, the channels are on the bar on the bottom and the signal strength is on the left. With signal strength, the closer you get to zero, the stronger the signal. So this is my wireless router right here. It's set to auto, so it decided to set itself to 2. And actually, that's fine because it looks like almost everyone did some research and decided to set their wireless routers to channel 11. The channel being used least in my area is channel 1. So it's best we stay on this side of the spectrum. You'll notice that since the wireless router decided to set itself to 2, it's actually overlapping with some of the signals down here. In this case, that is probably not a really big deal. But still, this is a good illustration. Changing your wireless router's channel is pretty easy if you know where the settings are. It's normally under Wireless Settings, which are under Advanced, then Wireless, and Wireless Settings. Once you're there, you can select which band you want to work on. Now this mix mode is for good if you have a lot of different types of devices. The channel width I go into depth in the ebook. And here's where you want to change your channel. Now like I said, you don't really have to worry about the 5 gigahertz side. But if you want to, that's fine. Now these settings are not really necessary. I'm just showing you some things. Channel width, it's in the ebook. Finally, we can change our channel. If you watch my home networking basics video, you know all about DNS. DNS is what helps your computer navigate its way around the internet. Without it, nothing works. Most home networks use the wireless router's IP address 
to forward all DNS requests to whatever DNS servers your internet service provider provides you with. Unfortunately, not all DNS servers are created equal. Some could be more busy or farther away than others, and that could make loading new web pages slower and more cumbersome. A long time ago, I got into the habit of bypassing my ISP's DNS servers and using Google's very reliable DNS server service, and I haven't looked back since. This means simply changing your DNS server address from whatever your wireless router's IP address is to 8.8.8.8. .8 you can do this on each individual computer on your network, or you can do it on all your computers at once by changing the setting on your wireless router. Doing this on your computer is easy. Simply go down to the bottom search bar and type in Ethernet or Wi-Fi, depending on which one you're using, and then change adapter options. Find your network connection, right click on it, and go to properties. In there you'll find internet protocol, go to properties, and then change the bottom one here to 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. To do the same thing to all your computers at once, we're going to want to go to the DHCP settings on the wireless router. Remember, the DHCP server on your wireless router assigns not only the IP addresses to all your computers, but also the default gateway and the DNS server address. So to do that, we simply log in to the wireless router, go to Advanced, then DHCP server, and that's the area where you want to make your changes. The typical lifespan for a wireless router is four to five years. After four to five years, the technology changes and something later and greater comes out. That doesn't mean your wireless router won't go through some changes during that time. Things are always changing on the internet, and many times wireless router manufacturers have to change to adapt to them. Wireless router manufacturers are always finding ways to tweak performance and add features to their wireless routers without having to create a whole new model. The way they do that is with firmware upgrades. So it's a good idea to periodically check your wireless router to make sure it's fully up to date and taking advantage of all those new features and tweaks. Before upgrading your wireless router's firmware, you want to be aware of certain things such as the model, the hardware version number, and the update it's currently on. So you can compare those numbers with the latest firmware update that's available. I go into way more detail on how to do this in my wireless router setup video. But here's a basic overview of what the process looks like. So basically, it's an advanced feature. You go down to System Tools on this particular router, and you go Firmware Upgrade. This is where you can check to see what version you're on. And if it needs an upgrade, you can go check for Upgrade. Once you have the file downloaded, you can simply browse to it and click Upgrade. When in doubt, reboot. In the IT field, there are no more enduring words of wisdom than this. No matter how advanced computers and electronics get, there's no substitute for a good old-fashioned reboot. There have been many more times than I care to remember when I spent a lot of time troubleshooting an issue, and then out of frustration, I just turned the computer off and on again, and like magic, the problem was fixed. We make a lot of demands on our computers and electronics, and sometimes they just need a break. A reboot gives a computer or a piece of electronic equipment a chance to calm down, sort itself out, and start over. It also gives a computer a chance to adjust to upgrades, updates, and configuration changes. Back in the day when Wi-Fi was new, people were always frustrated with how many times they had to reboot their wireless router to get them working again. Thankfully, that's not the case with newer devices. But if your wireless router is showing signs of just being stuck on something for no reason, a reboot can help. 
Okay, so that about takes care of all the free fixes. And now we're getting into things that might end up costing us a little bit of money. If none of the tweaks we've gone over to this point do any good, it's time to start taking stock of what exactly we have in terms of hardware. That means taking a closer look at what kind of wireless router we have, what kind of devices we have, and the wireless technology we're using. By wireless technology, I mean recent improvements to Wi-Fi that manufacturers have made in recent years, such as MU MIMO, beamforming, airtime fairness, quality of service, and Smart Connect. These are all features that can be found on many newer wireless routers and devices. I go into great detail on each one of these features in my Intro to Wi-Fi video. Maybe you've done some shopping for a wireless router before and you saw a description of a device saying something like this Wi-Fi 6 device is backwards compatible with Wi-Fi 5 and Wi-Fi 4. Backwards compatibility is great. It's always nice to know that a newer device will work with your old devices, but unfortunately there's no such thing as forward compatibility. Connecting a Wi-Fi 4 device to a Wi-Fi 5 wireless router does not turn your device into a Wi-Fi 5 device. It just slows your wireless router down to Wi-Fi 4 speed. In order to gain the full benefit of a Wi-Fi 5 wireless router, you need to be using Wi-Fi 5 devices. The same goes for some of these Wi-Fi technologies, such as MU MIMO and beamforming that I mentioned earlier. Many of those features only work with certain versions of Wi-Fi. I cover all the ins and outs of this in my Intro to Wi-Fi video. One of the cheapest upgrades you can do on your wireless network is by upgrading your wireless router's antennas. Most wireless router's antenna signal strength is only 3 to 5 dBi. For a few dollars, you can upgrade that to 9 or 10 dBi and realize an instant improvement in your Wi-Fi signal strength. Unfortunately, not all wireless router antennas are removable, so if you feel like this is something you'll end up doing in the long run, removable antennas are a feature you want to look for when buying a wireless router. When shopping for antennas, you want to try to find one that's made specifically for your wireless router. If you can't find any that are made specifically for your wireless router, you may have to get a little creative. And this means getting familiar with some of the terminology of the connectors on these things. Now, most of us can recognize the difference between a male and a female plug, but when it comes to these connectors, it can get confusing. Basically, all you have to remember is if you see RP, that means reverse polarity. What that means, whatever you're expecting to see, the opposite is true. As you can see by this illustration, an SMA male connector has a pin like you would expect. But an RP SMA male connector does not. Instead, it looks like a female connector. This is because of the reverse polarity of RP SMA. Another cheap but very effective upgrade is a wireless adapter. If you come home with a brand spanking new Wi-Fi 5 or Wi-Fi 6 wireless router, with all the latest and greatest technology, and all you have is an older laptop with a Wi-Fi 4 adapter, you will never realize all that Wi-Fi goodness unless you upgrade its adapter with a Wi-Fi 5 adapter that also supports all the latest technology. Here's a great example of a USB Wi-Fi 5 adapter that supports MU MIMO. It's the TP Link Archer T4U Plus AC 1300 USB wireless adapter. Let's do a quick unboxing. I'm pretty sure most people know how to take something out of a box. So as you can see the adapter has nice little antennas that you can move around. You can plug it into your obsolete laptop like this. And once you see the little green light blinking you're good to go. As an illustration of how quick and easy it is to change the capabilities of an old wireless N laptop with a wireless AC adapter. Let's take a quick look at the network connections 
on this computer. Now getting to your network settings depends on if you're on the Wi-Fi or the Ethernet. I'm on the Ethernet so I'm gonna say Ethernet. Go to Ethernet settings change adapter options. This is where you see all the network connections on your computer. Now on this particular laptop I have an Ethernet connection that's currently enabled and then we have the built-in Wi-Fi Intel Centrino Ultimate N wireless adapter. Boy that that really brings back some memories. Okay so to check out our internal network speed on the Ethernet cable Let's go to status and as we know cat 6 ethernet cable maxes out at 1 gigabit okay so now what we want to do is we want to connect our wireless end connection to the 5 gigahertz side of my wireless router okay so connect okay so we're connected Let's do a right click, go to status, and we can see that this is at 450 megabits per second. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to disconnect this. And I'm going to plug in the new wireless adapter. No drivers, no installation, simple plug and play. Okay, so there it is. Right click. Connect. Once again, I'm going to connect it to the 5 gigahertz side of my wireless router. And let's see the difference. So the Wi-Fi 4 adapter was 450 megabits per second. The Wi-Fi 5 wireless adapter is 860, which is very close to the 1 gigabit that we're getting with the Ethernet connection. If the wireless issue you're having is not really with a specific device, but a specific area of your home, say like a guest bedroom way off in the corner somewhere, and you don't want to spend a lot of money on a wireless router upgrade or even a mesh system, an easy way to handle that is with a wireless extender. A wireless extender is like a little baby wireless router without all the other wireless router features and connections. Basically, it picks up your wireless router signal and rebroadcasts it into another area of your home that may have wireless issues due to lack of range or signal strength. So here we have a perfectly placed wireless router, providing good coverage to all areas of the home except out here on the porch. We don't really spend a lot of time out here, so we don't want to spend a lot of money just to get a little Wi-Fi signal out on the porch. So we simply plug in a wireless extender into a wall outlet over here. And given that this wall here is not made out of metal or concrete, we should get just enough signal out here to keep a couple of smartphones satisfied. An in-depth explanation of how to set one of these things up would make this video way too long. So I provide that in my next video on extending your wireless network. Our expectations for our wireless devices and what they can do have come a long way in a short amount of time. And so have the capabilities of wireless routers. The fact that you're watching this video shows that the Wi-Fi connections in your home are not meeting your expectations. If that's the case, it will probably be time for some changes either now or in the near future. The good thing to all these advancements in technology is usually prices come down. You don't necessarily have to buy the biggest, baddest wireless router with the most antennas available on the market just to see some improvement on your home Wi-Fi network. You just need an understanding of what you need and what it will take to get there. There are still some very good wireless routers available for less than $100. You'll find good explanations of several of them on my site by clicking on the link below. If you're still using a wireless N or Wi-Fi 4 wireless router and you're having wireless networking problems, 
Your solution is very simple. You just need to upgrade to Wi-Fi 5 or wireless AC. You won't have to spend a ton of money to get good performance and as long as you get a wireless AC or Wi-Fi 5 Wave 2 device, you'll have most of the features you need for good Wi-Fi performance. Now, if you're into video games, you don't need me to tell you anything because you already have an EC router and a good understanding of what some of the latest features can do for you. A full explanation of these features can be found in my intro to Wi-Fi video. If you already have a Wi-Fi 5 router and you're thinking about getting a Wi-Fi 6 router, your decision should really hinge on how many Wi-Fi 6 devices you have. If you have mostly Wi-Fi 5 devices, you will realize next to no improvement by getting a Wi-Fi 6 router, even though Wi-Fi 6 is backwards compatible with Wi-Fi 5. I would not go out and get a Wi-Fi 6 router until either I have a lot of Wi-Fi 6 devices or Wi-Fi 6 devices have become more commonplace. The final word with Wi-Fi performance is mesh. Someday all home networks may be mesh networks and we'll be looking at the way we do things today with conventional routers as the old-fashioned way. Most mesh systems are extremely easy to set up and provide excellent Wi-Fi performance in homes up to and sometimes exceeding 5,000 square feet. They have extremely intuitive smartphone interfaces you can use to set them up and configure them. One of the greatest things about mesh is called seamless roaming, which means even though you have multiple access points throughout your home, you don't have to disconnect and reconnect from the wireless network as you roam from one to the other. The only downside with mesh is cost, and even that's coming down. You'll find a link in the description below for a top performing mesh system for under $200. Mesh is kind of a big topic, so I'll be getting more into it in my next video on extending your wireless network. If you tried everything we mentioned in this video to improve your Wi-Fi performance and you're still having problems surfing the internet, maybe your problem isn't Wi-Fi at all. Your problem could be with your ISP and your wired connection to the internet. If you immediately call your ISP with your suspicions, they will most likely tell you they're going to do some tests and then they'll tell you everything is fine on their end. If you really want to get someone to come out there and look at the connection inside and outside your home, you're going to have to strong arm them a little bit by telling them some of the troubleshooting steps you've already taken. You'll also want to test the speed coming directly out of your modem to determine whether the issue is the ISP or something on your network. To do this, you want to unplug the cable coming from the modem into your wireless router and plug it into a laptop or computer so your computer has a direct connection to the internet. You may have to reboot to get the IP address directly from the ISP just like your wireless router did. Once you're connected to the internet, go to speedtest.net and record your speed. If it's not what you're paying for, you'll be armed with this information when you have the dreaded conversation with your ISP. Once you're on the phone with them, you'll be glad if you followed some of the troubleshooting steps you found in this video. Because once they realize they're on the phone with someone who knows what they're talking about, they'll be far less likely to give someone like that the runaround. Hopefully, once you convince them that the issue was not you, but them, they will send somebody out there and take a look at your connection inside and out and fix the issue. Some internet service providers are better at this kind of customer service than others. Worst case scenario is you'll end up taking your business elsewhere or possibly upgrading your internet service. Okay, well that concludes this video on improving your Wi-Fi performance. I hope you got something out of it. If you did, please do the thing to be notified of my upcoming videos. In my next video, I'll cover extending your home wireless network with extenders, power line, and mesh. <laughs>